Everyone look, it's Tim Robinson. Oh, Timmy. Oh, no. Timmy Robinson's I Think You Should Leave is, in my opinion, one of the best sketch comedy shows out right now. For the simple fact that it has an insanely high hit rate, it is more than frequently presenting us with sketches that are unlike anything else I've ever seen. We're just shooting funerals and showing the ones where the bodies fly out. <laughs> There's already a bunch of videos about I think you should leave quotes that live rent-free in my head. And they're all bouncing around the web like a beach ball at a Nickelback concert. How has this show already done so much? It's only two seasons. It's only 12 episodes. How are there so many insane sketches in this show? How do you keep doing this, Tim? What do you know? Many of the world's brightest minds have attempted to crack the code on Tim's secret. And after each of them becoming unsuccessful, they reached out to The Rock for help. So today we're going to break down three of the craziest sketches from I think you should leave front to back, and by the end of that we'll have a real understanding of why Tim's sketches hit so hard, and how they're unlike anything else we've ever seen. Also just want to make a quick note that while it is Tim's show, and he is leading the charge as the show's creator, executive producer, lead writer, and lead actor, there's also a lot of very talented writers and directors who are also responsible for these sketches shaping up the way that they are. Let's go. We drop into our first scene at Ground Zero, Driving School. The teacher, played by Tim Robinson, is going to play the class of video. Now, these videos are a little old. They look a little dated. I don't want to hear any jokes about them. And uh, don't let the style distract you. And I don't want any questions about the tables! Okay, stop. That one yell was all we needed to hear to understand that this guy's taught this class many times before, he's shown this video many times before, and he hates it when people ask about the tables. Don't ask about the tables. I'm not sure what tables have to do with driving, but okay, fine, no tables. I'll be home from work soon. I'm just picking up my last table. What the hell did Eddie do to my table? Hey man, I just got my table back, and I don't know what the hell Eddie Munster did to my table. These tables are how I buy my house. They keep my house hot. The tables are my corn. Mom! The critical details here are the visible confusion in the class and Tim fiercely looking around at their reactions and getting upset every time they're confused about the tables. <laughs> so what the fuck is going on with that? What's the deal with their tables? And sure enough, this leads to her demise. Pretty serious. Any questions? Yeah. What was her job? Tables. What do you mean? Guys, what I say. And what's hilarious to me is that this guy feels like he's done nothing wrong. Like, he thinks that he's the victim and that these kids are in the wrong. Like, if this were an am I the asshole situation, that they would be the assholes because they're asking about the tables, even though he specifically asked them not to. Like, dog, if you don't want people to ask about the tables, then why is this whole table plot line deeply embedded into the story of this woman getting into a car crash? You didn't, they didn't need to keep all those parts edited in where she was talking about her table. She could have just gone from paying attention on the road to turning around for a second and crashing. I don't think she should have yelled at Eddie. She actually didn't yell at Eddie Munster. I've seen this a ton of times. What does she do? Tables! And he's seen this enough times to know that she didn't yell at Eddie Munster, but somehow this front of stage dominating plot line has just escaped him every time. The tea just fed up, so we're moving on. I'm going to show you a whole new video, and I want you to tell me what the person in the video did right or wrong. It's the same woman. Shh. I just got screamed at by Freddy Krueger. All I said was, what'd you do to my table? It's filthy. You should be ashamed of yourself. And there's no way I'm not taking a moment here to acknowledge Patty Harrison. In all honesty, I've learned about her from seeing her in this show. So if you've seen her in anything else I should know about, drop a little bit of that and a little bit of that. In this show, she absolutely kills it every single time she's on screen. Seriously. We love Patty. I love just, just trying to wipe it down with a rag while driving and screaming fuck. Fuck! They're so dirty! <laughs> What'd you do wrong? What is her job? Hey! Balls. This sketch is like they took normal driving school and they freaked it. The conflict is the teacher wants the kids to get through the video and simply answer the question. She's saying what she did wrong is she wasn't watching the road. She was doing other stuff. Eyes weren't on the road, hands weren't on the wheel. But 
they want to know what's going on with this plot line. Like, what's going on here? There's this enormous Tables trilogy in the videos. And despite having seen this in his words a ton of times, he doesn't know about it? It's like this guy's watching a different video. So the second installation of the safe driving video is about 5% not paying attention to the road and about 95% Tables narrative. But this is where it goes bonkers. I'm going to show you one more video. Is it the same woman? Uh, it's the same actress. I don't know if she's supposed to be the same person. What do you mean you don't know if it's supposed to be the same person. What do you mean you don't know what her job is? It's clearly explained in the third video. Her supposed rival rolls up to her in traffic with a slicked back hair like a real piece of shit. He addresses her by name. What's up, Gary? She calls him a fucking pig. Go to hell, George, you fucking pig! Meanwhile, this dude is straight up blocking traffic to have this encounter. Come on, go! And then, at the very end of the third act, in the climax, we do get the crucial piece of information we've been looking for this whole time. If you're gonna keep renting tables to Comic Cons and Horror Cons, you better learn how to treat the talent. It turns out she rents tables to Comic Cons and Horror Cons. That's why she's always dealing with folk like Freddy Krueger's and Eddie Munster's. That's what she's been on about. That's why she's so upset about her tables. Oh my god, that's why. SHUT UP! This is the maddest I've ever been! Any questions? Why is there swearing? They didn't! All they said was shoot! <laughs> Don't laugh! A wise rock me once said that the mark of an effective artist is the ability to do more with less. And I really did just make that up right now. I pulled it out of my rock ass. Sometimes having huge sets and huge gags is really fun and really enjoyable. But give a comedian an essentially simple scenario, like driving school teacher shows class some videos, and see how much that they can do with that. That will show you which ones only know how to make things look good on the surface, and which ones really understand how to set up a conflict that you can actually get a lot of juice out of. Tim's plots don't just twist. They start going one way, and then they suddenly swerve off in one direction, and start going down rabbit holes for unreasonably long periods of time. Sometimes I wonder if it's a game to him, how long he can go down a path and still make it connect back to the main plot line, thereby justifying its absurd occurrence. This is a theme we're absolutely going to see throughout his sketches, so... And by we're going to see it, I mean immediately right now as we get into the second sketch. Okay, next sketch. What's going on here? It's guy's night. It's poker, and it's snacks, and it's brews, and it's venting all of our frustrations about the old ball and chain, right guys? I'm not arguing. Easy to just say, okay, honey, okay. <laughs> I've got nothing. That's what your wife said. Oh. My wife has nothing to complain about. Yeah, yeah. Unless you're talking about every little thing I've ever done. <laughs> yeah, nothing crazy. Your normal night in, dudes being bros having fun, and our protagonist finds a moment to chime in. You guys would be clugging a few cans too if you had my wife. <laughs> and immediately he makes a face about it, and he puts his head in his hands. Buckle up. Enter a gracefully uplifting montage. We see him and his wife spending time together. He's being a silly goose, and she finds it funny, and they're dancing together. They're living truly happy lives together. You know, what most people want out of life. He comes home one day and he tells her that he's got some great news. I uh, auditioned for a play. And I got the part. Oh my god! <laughs> Your husband is a henchman. You're a henchman! <laughs> And look how quickly that goes to shit. How is your dress rehearsal? Jamie Taco keeps taking my lines. Who's Jamie Taco? You know when you're so frustrated about something that you just can't help but say it how it occurs to you, even if that means like mentioning names of people that you've literally never brought up before? He's the other henchman. He says my lines before I can even get them out, and then the director doesn't do anything. He, Jamie took like 15 of my lines. What do you mean he says them before you can get them out? He says them so fast, and they become his lines. I should just quit. I don't even know what I'm doing. Right Honey, now. no. But I'm never going to say my lines faster than Jamie Taco. It's like, okay, this dude just signed up for this play out of nowhere. He got the part, and he's super stoked about it, and then just immediately freaking about this Jamie Taco guy, and he's saying his lines fast. Like, what? You're freaking out, bro. What's going on? So our protagonist confronts Jamie about it. Ridiculous. Hey, stuff. Jamie? Yes. Uh, some of the lines you're saying might be my lines. And Jamie's just an absolute jerk about it. You gotta it. be much quicker than that if you wanna have those lines. The audience doesn't know whose lines they are. And if I say them, they're mine. And I'm quick. Hey, Brandon, wait up. I'm starving. Come on. 
Now, during the performance, Jamie steals most of his lines. I'll slap your freaking head around your jabroni. Now give me some fazool, I'm hungry. This is what is endlessly fascinating to me about this one, the world building, and how the subtle story details carry major world building implications. Jamie is in fact saying the lines faster than our protagonist, and thereby taking them. And the fact that nobody in the audience protests this, they have no problem with it, they just accept it, and that the director, who's been working with them for however long, weeks, months, whatever, the director has done absolutely nothing to change this, implies that in this universe, Universe, saying lines faster is better than saying them well. Even if you're saying them so fast to the point that they're just straight up gibberish. Don't you talk to me like that? I got about 1500 guys that'll pop you. Ah, my fazool. Our protagonist is fed up and he beats Jamie at his own game. Run the keys again, the freaking truck, you jabroni! I'll stop you, jabronis! And there's his wife. She was there for him when he was struggling with this. She reassured him. And now she's here to see him overcome it. And now she's here reassuring his success after the fact. What an incredibly loving and supportive partner. This part's crucial too. Look how the protagonist handles the situation. Good job tonight, Jamie. I'm gonna get that line tomorrow. This to me tells us everything we need to know about these two characters. When Jamie was up, he was an absolute jerk to the protagonist. When he's down, he swears for bitter revenge. When our protag was down, he handled it with class and consideration. And now that he's up, he continues to take the high road and extend an olive branch of camaraderie to Jamie. The way Jamie acts in success and defeat reflects the immaturity of his character, and by contrast, reflects the maturity of our main character and his wife to take the high road in both success and defeat. I am so proud of you. I love you. I love you. Hey, when you say... All of which was to say that he actually loves his wife and he's been recalling this whole period of his life in regret right after cracking a joke about her with the boys. I am fascinated by the length of his rabbit hole, the fact that it comes full circle and in such a real way, and ultimately the values that this insane sketch is unironically standing for. Oh no, I, I wish I wish I hadn't have said that. I love my wife. She helped me when I freaked out about Jamie Taco. Come on, man, we're all just joking around. Yeah, come on. I'm, 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 I'm gonna go. I, I'm not gonna stay the night. Oh, come on. Enough with the I hate my significant other jokes. What a terrible idea to keep in your life. Oh, I hate the person I chose to spend the rest of my life with. Really? Fuck that. If you got a wife, I hope you love your wife. Cause you know what? She did help you when you freaked out about Jamie Taco. Well, I just about freaked out when I saw this last sketch. Crash War is one of my favorite sketches in the whole show. Here's how it goes down. So it presents itself to us as a movie trailer. Immediately we see guns, money, and drugs. Crash More appears to kill all the bad guys. Hey, fuck, I pull it, you fuckers! You fucking suck! He repeats. You fucking suck! <laughs> I don't see anything wrong with this. I feel like the Avengers could have said the exact same thing. Good guys stop bad guy because they suck. They deserved every fucking bullet I pumped in their heads, Chief. Jesus. God, I am so fucking pissed. So he gets home from his day of killing, and despite being so pissed, he's ready for his anniversary, flowers in hand. Cause you know, he knows how to keep a good work-life balance. But it's the worst news imaginable. Honey, I'm home! Happy anniversary. No. And as you can imagine, Crashmore's obliterated by this. Who wouldn't be? I can't stop crying. They killed your whole family. Goddamn. So naturally, his purpose is revenge. This is a guy who's gonna track down these sons of bitches and uncork the ass beating of a lifetime on them. Fuck you! You suck! Quick running, damn it! I'm obsessed with his straightforward demeanor. With Linda Easley as Monique. He said he'd kill us both. He might kill you, but there's no fucking way he's ever killing me. Fucking asshole, he said that? And then this next part is where I lost it. Cause I don't know about you, but the whole time I'm watching this, my ADHD brain can't help but keep thinking to myself the whole time, like, this guy kinda looks like Santa Claus, doesn't he? Like, he's got the right beard for it, that's for sure. And I think that maybe they were banking on some of us thinking the same thing. Because sure enough... And starring Santa Claus as Detective Crashmore. It isn't even a guy that looks like Santa. No, it just is Santa Claus that sent me. But I'm not done yet! There's a part two! And part two is an interview segment from our good friends over at AOL Blast. Let's talk to the lead actors from this movie to get some insider details. Take note that the mood in the room is fun. 
The actors are all cheesing it, and they appear to just be happy to be part of such a big film. Of course, the man who needs no introduction. You might know him from his other job, delivering presents to kids all over the world on Christmas. The way that Crash Moore immediately starts getting up. The supporting actors are painfully uncomfortable. Do not mention Christmas or that I do it at all. Uh, would you like me to interview you as an actor? That would be fucking great for me. Thank you. Unprofessional bullshit. That's why no one watches AOL Blast. Bullshit. And watch how fast he returns to his excitement like a little kid. How would you describe Detective Crashmore? It's a cosmic mix. It's kind of a cosmic gumbo. Ryan and I would joke on set about it being a cosmic gumbo. And now this is my favorite part of the sketch. We're about to go off-road again. And throughout it all, Santa himself turns out to be such a self-righteous asshole. He literally gets in one movie and is like Spongebob from As Seen on TV. But, uh... Um, let's, let's talk for a second about the nudity in the film. Was that scary for you as an actor to do? Well, the script called for it. What are we, 10 years old? I've seen every cock on the planet. You what? Which is like, okay, so Santa's magic, so included in that kit is x-ray vision, apparently. Um, why? So are you seen everyone naked? Yeah. See if they got tattoos. Okay, so my last question has just been overtaken by my next question. To see if they got tattoos, why? They do, they get no gift. It's if you get a tattoo, you don't get anything for Christmas? Not that year. Getting a tattoo is not good. I don't care about it, but it's not good behavior. What does that mean? You clearly do care about it in some capacity or you wouldn't be bringing it up right now. And then just out of the blue, he throws in a... I got paid two bill to play Crash War. This exchange is something else because the host immediately replies with a very good question. How does that money help you? What an astute observation. Because you're right. How does that money help you, Santa? You're fucking magic. You said you've seen everyone naked. What does that money allow you to do that you haven't been able to do before? Well, it does because that amount is called by quote. So the next film I'm offered, they have to pay that same amount. And he doesn't even give us a straight answer about how it helps him. He just says so he can keep getting two mil again. Even if I do a bad job, that means as long as I'm offered even one more movie, I can get two more mil. Even if I do a bad job, they gotta give me that other two mil. <sighs> this guy just sucks, dude. I feel like that's the essence of most Tim Robinson sketches. It's just, oh, this guy sucks, dude. Hence the name, I think you should leave. Loot box! Okay, so we've cleared all three rooms in this dungeon, just like that. Out comes our loot box. You've got new spins on simple ideas, like the driving school videos, the I hate my wife jokes, and the action movie trailer. You've got absurdly long rabbit holes that often come full circle, like the deeply embedded tables plotline, with resolution, and recalling memories of your wife helping you through hard times. you got the subtle world building implications, like how the speed of the line read is better than the quality of line read in this universe. It's, it's great. And this is just what I picked up from this run. There's definitely more loot there. If you haven't seen the show, I assure you there are tons of other outstanding sketches with much more loot to be found. And if you have seen the show, you may be like, how did you make this video and not talk about? And then insert one of the literal dozens of sketches I could have put in this video. Uh, so if you feel that way, drop that comment. Let me know which sketches I should look at. Should I make more videos on I Think You Should Leave before season three comes out? Let me know. Thank you for coming to my rock talk. I love you and catch you in the next episode. Peace!